Good okay. morning. Can you think of a more banal title for Hi a there. book than Today Canada Has a Future? Oatmeal. We're going to be talking about that oatmeal? particular book What's this morning. I suppose that we should so be I'm really sure. glad that somebody and thinks Canada right has a future because it's not so long ago in the early nice post-war years when we were filled with doomsday predictions, when the birds didn't sing, when the seas were going to dry up, when the population on Earth was going to choke us absolutely to death, when world troubles and trials and tribulations were beyond man's conception and one tempted to sit back as some of us do now and say, well, in a final analysis, enjoy things while you can, it won't last, and in any case, it doesn't matter a damn. Now, specifically before I tell you what I'm going to do this morning, what about Canada and British Columbia in specific terms? That's what I want to put to you. Because some people think that Vancouver could have been and should still be the heartland of a coastal territory with a population of at least 10 million people. It obviously has the climate, the setting, the beauty, and the resources with an outlet to the Pacific Rim. But what, uh, like the rest of the country, British Columbia may not even yet have the will to desire to develop other than the natural growth within an egalitarian, bureaucratized welfare state that we cannot avoid. That's one of the subjects I'm going to tackle this morning. The other subject is, if anything, even more potentially more depressing. Adolescent suicide has tripled, tripled in the past 20 years. And Bre Brenda Rabkin is here today to talk about our happy little book, Growing Up Dead. And we'll talk, among other things, about why teenagers with so much ahead of them want to take their lives and how they do it. 50, 50 pills. Where'd you get them? I got them from a doctor who said I had bad nerves and gave me a lot of pills, gave me pills every, every week. And you saved them up and took oh, yeah. them? Oh, yeah. I found the pills just put me to sleep every day. So I just put them in my drawer and finally took them all. I figured I might as well go to sleep. <laughs> Brenda, though, is not quite so depressing in her outlook as that little film clip would uh, seem to indicate. But first, the top of the program this morning is with the Herman Kahn, who is the founder of the Hudson Think Tank, the Hudson Institute in New York. And with him is the executive director of the Canadian Hudson Institute, Marie José Drouin. And we'll have at them in a couple of minutes. Like most Western Canadians, I have seen the name in the paper a thousand times over the past number of years, Herman Kahn. You tell me who you are and what you do and why you do it. Just let people uh, know who you are. I know how important you are, but who are you? Well, I'm an ex-physicist, uh, works in public policy research. Uh, mostly we work for the U.S. government, foreign governments, state governments. Uh, we do a certain amount of work for business. We think of ourselves as policy researchers, not as futurologists. Uh, but uh, we've been labeled futurologists, and we don't fight for the, the name. You're the can of the, the Hudson, Croton on the, what is it, Croton? Croton Hudson. Croton on Hudson Institute. Now, you are a, you were a doomsday man, were you not? Were you not one of the people to whom I was referring earlier on about the end of the birds, the seas, 
the no, nuclear devastation? No, uh, I was much more frightening than that. What were you? Oh, I said, if you have a nuclear war, it's not the end of history. You'll experience it, you'll live through it, and you'll have to answer afterwards what you did during the war. That's, a, that's much more frightening. The end of history is kind of peaceful. And people sort of felt comfortable with that idea. I said, that could be the end of history, and that's going to mean that you have to worry about it and you're responsible for what happens. You mean we'd have to, we, we would have to start all over again after the nuclear devastation? Yeah, and more than that, I said, it, it, it wouldn't be true that the survivors would envy the dead or anything like that. Conditions after nuclear war are likely to be very, very bad by pre-war standards, but they're not going to be as bad, say, as they were 500 years ago. In other words, man is going to survive? As far as we can tell. Do you still predict a nuclear holocaust? No, we, uh, we wouldn't be surprised if there was a nuclear war. We'd be a little bit surprised if there was a holocaust. And even if it's a holocaust, we were very surprised it was a worldwide holocaust. In other words, there's going to be a limited nuclear explosion of some kind, some kind. That would not be surprising. In your time, in my time, you're 58, I'm 60. Yeah, I'm, I'm only 56 now. 56. <laughs> in your time? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, I'd give you, like, even money. Even money? No. Right. Why bother to talk about Canada's future at all? Well, partly because the war might not involve Canada. Partly because the even money means that it's... Uh, even money that is no war. And actually, when I say even money that nuclear weapons will be used in anger, they're more likely to be a small use than a big use. Like in Israel? Israel is a possibility. Uh, more likely, I would be in the Pacific. In the Pacific, some minor nuclear war in the Pacific. I don't want to, d sure. I don't want to distract, though, from a r real purpose of our interview. Sure. I want you to take a look at the world today, the Western world especially, and tell us if Canada is really any different. Because in your book, you say, given this and given that and stay in one piece, we have a so-so future. Look at the world first and tell us about this state of sloth which seems to encompass well, us. Well, basically, we, be, we feel that both the rich communist countries and the rich capitalist countries are going to do so-so for the next, say, two or three decades. But the middle-income countries are on their way up still. Uh, they'll probably grow about twice as fast, and they're excited about it, and they got the kind of a land and morale and commitment which we used to have, but don't anymore. Name a middle-income country. Uh, well, China's the most obvious one. But we think of, when we think of middle-income, we normally think of Brazil, of Mexico, of South Korea, of Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Southern Europe. Uh, but the, uh, Brazil and Mexico are the two biggest. What you're telling me is that all your, oh, by the way, you computerize all your predictions, I suppose. No, no, we don't use computers much. I like computers. I used to design them. And uh, I use a computer whenever I can, legitimately. But the heart of our studies cannot be computerized. In other words, it's a computer, as you say in your book, the unprogrammed one at the top and of your shoulders. Hand, absolutely. I uh, have to enjoy computers. That's a separate issue. Just back on the Hudson Think Tank again. Where do you get your money for the Hudson Think Tank? Uh, about half our income tends to come from the United States government, various departments. Not the government as a whole, but you know, one department or the other. About a quarter to a third will come from business, and about a quarter to a sixth will be uh, miscellaneous. But can you get the truth in your future planning? The biggest, quote, scandal that I can think of in Canada were the years in which we were conned by the oil companies, that we had, oh, unlimited oil and energy ahead. And then all of a sudden, they began to take a sharp look, maybe it was you, and were told we're going to run out of fuel by 1985, it was at one time. Yeah. How can you tell the future, or foretell it even semi-accurately if the big corporations hide the truth from you? Well, I don't think they were hiding the truth. In the early 70s, before the oil shock, the big companies thought, thought they were going to run out of oil. It's too strong a word. They, they thought they could talk Saudi Arabia into boosting 20 million barrels a day, and that would put off the uh, oil shortage. No, I'm sorry. We were told that we had unlimited oil in the north of Canada, and then we were yeah. told suddenly it's not there. Now they say yeah. it's coming back again. Yeah, that's a question about the price. At uh, $3 a barrel, you got no oil in northern Canada. At $12 a barrel, you got a lot. I'm going to turn now to Marie Jose Drouin, who is the executive director of the Canadian branch, right? Well, the Canadian, the Canadian affiliate. Okay. Who put up the money for uh, the study on Canada with its future? Might as well show the book sometime. Canada has a future. Who put that money up? A group of Canadian corporations provided us with restricted grants to undertake that study. How much? $200,000. $200,000. Didn't you, weren't you not at one time executive uh, assistant to our celebrated Pierre Goyer? That's right. At the time when Pierre Goyer caused great public laughter in this country when he suggested we bring in 40,000 Koreans 
to um, develop the Athabascan tar sands. No, I wasn't his executive assistant at that point. I had left his office. Was that a good idea of his, or was that a crazy idea which was properly laughed out of court? Well, I don't. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't an idea that I took. Uh, that I that I spent a lot of time exploring Seriously. and, and well, uh, studying. And nor did he. I th it was more an idea That's that Herman. Idea. That, you have, that you have to blame me for that idea. <laughs> You're to blame for that idea. And I, and I still think it's a good one. <laughs> Realizing the intense potential racism that could be in this country with a large influx no. of different colored people. You, sh you shouldn't. I don't believe you would wish to uh, have them immigrate to this country. That I think is fair. Though actually, Queens make very good immigrants in the United States. Uh, the, the, the concept was exactly like the Queens are now doing in Saudi Arabia and Iran and everywhere in the world, by the way. Germany. Germany, uh, where they come in temporarily because they're very good construction people, they're very cheap, very reliable, and very well behaved. Very well behaved. So that even and they go home nicely when they're told and they're they not go home. They go home nicely when the contract's finished. <laughs> now. But you say it's a good idea. Not, a, I mean, it, it was a good idea at that point. No, it lo no longer is. Oh, today it would being. still be a good idea, but nowhere near as good idea. Today is much more. I mean, today the idea has uh, it's basically disappeared. It's basically disappeared. Yeah. Right. You and the, the reason for it disappeared. Thanks. Must give credit to the other author, uh, B. Bruce Biggs. That's right. Uh, you do Canada has a future. Before we talk about B.C., why, why with the incredible resources we have? I mean, we've, we're the storehouse for the world, you know, if you want to use that old baloney. Why is our future only so-so? Well, you're one of the very few people, <laughs> first of all, who make, who would make the point that we are the storehouse. Uh, if you look in the bureaucracy um, and most of the media, you have uh, the, the dominating thesis there is limits to growth, that in fact, no, we are running out of resources, that you even hear Canadians saying that we're running out of land. And there's a general pessimism that seems to have pervaded in this country, at least at the official policy levels. And in a sense, saying that Canada has a future was a terribly optimistic statement in that context. We say so-so because of this, this basic ideology, or let's say economic culture, which is such that people don't have the will and the desire or the drive. But when uh, you say people don't have the will, you're not talking about the ordinary person who's interested in a decent house, a decent job, a little boat, a holiday in Hawaii. Who is it that, that prevents the, the will for the ordinary progress um, from flowering? We call, it? we call them the new class in the book, and I would, I would lump into that category the bureaucrats, um, the staffs of the large corporations, many of the staff members of the large corporations, to a certain extent a significant part of the media, and also a significant part of the arts community. And they are, whether we like it or not, in decision-making positions You mean the ones who are the squealing like stuck pigs because various cultural grants at the moment after years of Piola giveaways are having their throats cut? Well, the arts community uh, is, is one part, but I think you have to look at the government bureaucracy what you're and talking the about intellectuals to a much, much more significant extent. Corporate mandarins, uh, government mandarins, um, those of the media who came up through the 60s as former flower children who want to protect their own environment and the hell with the working man. What do you think of that, Herman? I think that's exactly right. I'm uh, right. Yeah, I've uh, been saying it for years. Uh, it's been a fairly obvious point. Every, everybody's noticed it. But, no, they but until recently, there have been very few studies. No, they've actually noticed it even without talking about it. They say, oh, you're Mike, oh, you're a member of the Sierra Club. Shake hands. We, we, we like each other. Respect. Ah, we're, we're both nice guys, That's you see. Right. We and love then, people, but uh, let's keep our little country cottage free from any pollution. Yeah, they don't love people. They love, the, no, they claim maybe. to love the land, but the idea is to protect the land from people. Let's grind some more axes. <laughs> Hammond can looking at Canada specifically, or perhaps they should go to Marie Jose. You can each answer it. Um, the future is there. We yes. can't avoid the future. But are we? Are we? I often say, knowing nothing, that we're four or five years behind the dead hand of British apathy. <laughs> True or false? In other words, we're only four or five years to catch up with their incredible massive welfare bureaucracy with demotivated people in many ways. I would say you're at least half true. Uh, Something. But uh, it's, it's not quite as bad here as in, as in England. 
Uh, well, in some ways, England, is, is, you know, England has very good qualities, too, about it, of course. It does have a level of politeness and uh, sort of legality. Oh, well, civilization, yes. Yeah. Sophistication, yeah. yes. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about the fact that while the pound has gone up to $2.40 again, surely your view of the future of Britain is not good. Uh, in some ways, it's better than it used to be. Because the big problem with England was that the continent was outracing it. The continent is slowing down, too, now. The which? The continent. The European, Europe, the continent, used to go much faster than England. England was the richest country per capita in Europe after World War II. It's now one of the poorest. It's one of the three countries which gets relief from the European economic community. Uh, now, uh, at the moment, uh, the standard of living on the continent is almost double of Engl England. And if that was going to increase even more, England would be in serious trouble. But it looks now that uh, that will stay. Uh, roughly, the continent will be twice as rich per capita as England, but it won't get even richer. So that, and that helps England a lot. So one of the points we made in the book is specifically that, that Britain's problem is that it didn't catch up, but it lived as if it had caught up. Canada was, did have one of the rapid, mo most rapid growth rates in all of the OECD countries, and therefore it allowed us to this proliferation, let's say, of welfare and what have you. Nevertheless, if we don't, if the gap, now there is a gap between Canada and the U.S., and if we, we don't um, close the gap, if we don't continue to grow, and yet we continue to spend, then we are going, quote, unquote, the British route. But it's a different problem to start with. Marie, Jose, what do we have to do? One, is it desirable from the point of view of the Hudson Institute, the Montreal branch, to close the gap? And two, what do we have to do? Well, it's desirable to close the gap if we want to maintain a, the sta our standard of living. Should we and maintain our standard of living? I think that from the point of view of the average Canadian, the ordinary Canadian, yes. Uh, from the point of view of the upper middle classes, they probably lose if the, if the uh, working class May improves I its standard of living. May I dare to ask you which side you are on? Are you on the side of the working class who wants to improve the standard of living? Or are you accepting this new upper middle class of Mandarin bureaucrat Fink? Well, who wants to hold the country back. Well, I obviously wouldn't write it, that kind of a book if I were on the side of the upper middle class. Think, think uh, of the word like <laughs> <I> a book. <laughs> think, so the yeah. upper middle class. So I, I realize that I, would pro I probably lose more than I gain. Because you are one of the upper middle class. Yeah. Yes, of course. Nice but I'm willing to pay the price. And the, the price would be a good price. So the price would Absolutely. be an improvement in all of Canadians' living standards. Absolutely. Right. From the book, I have a piece in which, uh, most depressing, it says, a, a decade ago, we would have flagged Vancouver as having the most promising future in any Canadian metropolitan area. Could have been the best, could have been the biggest. The could have beens have gone. The limits to growth are extremely powerful in Vancouver. And despite, but despite the will of the upper classes and the ferociously militant trade union, we're going to get by. Give me some of the facts on which you base that very strong observation. Well, let's look at the could have been. Um, in terms of world, world economic growth, the Pacific Basin, we flag as one of the high growth regions of the world uh, for the next decade. Um, in terms of BC's resource base, uh, it has a particular advantage as opposed to other Canadian regions. Uh, in terms of the climate, it's a very pleasant place to live, and you're seeing that you know, the number of people who retire in British Columbia. Are you blaming the British um, Columbia people for this could have been? Well, I'm saying that, uh, yes, largely. That the people here um, enjoy, know they have, they have a very pleasant environment to live in. Uh, they know that a lot of people would like to come, but they don't particularly welcome them. They don't particularly want this massive inflow of immigrants or this massive, whether they come from Canada or whether they come from the rest of the well, world. You got me there. Then you have it good. You're, you know, you're comfortable and don't come and ruin it for but me. But is there not another reason where it only could have been? that the entire corporate power structure in Canada is away back in the east, in central Canada. For instance, we can't have a steel plant here because Algoma will undersell us unless they own it. Yeah, but given trends in Canada now, you're having the, the west is now gaining advantage because of your resource base. I mean, that's true, that's true historically, but you probably have more bargaining power now than you've ever had in Canadian history. And, you know, that, that's another could have been. Having the bargaining power, do we have the political clout? Look at Trudeau's proposition for this phony House of Federation, or Bennett's phony proposition for an appointed Senate of political hacks. And only today in Ottawa, they're meeting right now with the First Ministers. What about the political future of this country? Do you see, if we got up off our knees, 
would we tend to become a Quebec and think about breaking away from all these hold back mandarins in the east? Well, I think you've already expressed, there's many, many people in British Columbia have already expressed that position that they could probably go it alone. And could we? Strictly in economic terms, um, you probably could. Uh, you know, given the, 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 the But we don't have the wealth of Alberta or Saskatchewan, the easily obtainable wealth, do we? Well, you have you you don't have the same wealth as Alberta and Saskatchewan, but you certainly have you have the forest products, you have the mines, you have some energy, and also you have you know you're an important trade center. Probably could go it alone if being part of Canada doesn't have any any significant uh, attachment. attachment. Did you say, and here I'm changing hats, the Fraser Valley could probably hold 10 million here at very low low densities. Yes, we did. I mean, it probably if you're if you're looking just in terms of, of what it could hold in terms of the number of people, without any without any comment on the social and political aspirations of the people who are there. Yes, it could hold, technically it could hold 10 million people, but Vancouver has chosen not to develop in that way. And that's, that's the name of the game, at least for the oh, next decade. You're aware, of course, I should ask you if you're aware of anything about our socialist government we had in British Columbia, right? Sure. And one of the first thing it did was slap down a widely accepted, they were stupid about it, a widely accepted land freeze to save all agricultural land. Was that a bad thing to do from terms of potential uh, development for income? There's no question that, that it, it, something like that is not going to kill your development. It really slows it down enormously. Whether it's a bad thing or not is whether you want to have a teeming metropolitan area of 10 million people with all the pluses and minuses of 10 million people or whether you prefer uh, having the green space. Now, uh, from the viewpoint of the world, I think the 10 million people makes the world better off. No question about that. But the point Marie Jose made is a very good one that the local people may prefer the green space. What annoys me is not that they do that, but they say they're running out of farmland, which are is absolute nonsense. All right, are we running out of farmland? Are we entitled to keep the Fraser Valley to our selfish little selves on the west coast of Canada? Which Why are these big noises, uh, Ham and Can and... Uh, Marie, José, Drouin, etc. in Vancouver just now. Because the Vancouver chapter of the North American Society for Corporate Planning is having a conference at the Bayshore tomorrow. And it's called BC Has a Future Too. And everybody who is anybody, except for myself, who I'm taking part in it too, can go to it. It's speaking at it. Seating available for additional attendees at the conference. Registration today by calling 683-6711. Or tomorrow by going to the Bay Shore at half past eight in the morning, and the program starts at half past eight. Herman, what are you going to be talking about tomorrow? I'll be giving kind of a world context for Canada and British Columbia. World? World context. World context. context. Yeah, sort of what's going on. In you know, you not only come from New York, you don't, not only have your think tank in New York, but you've got a New York accent. Oh, well, I was raised in New York. <laughs> yeah, context, context for Canada. Now, this $10 million people in the Fraser Valley, you see, I'll go along with you, Marie, Jose, and that I hate this new class. I hate to be manipulated by a bunch of civil servants or culture bundist civil servants with indexed pensions. But at the same time, I strongly <laughs> object to the thought of 10 million people in the Fraser Valley. Talk me out of it. Why should we have 10 million people in the Fraser Valley for the good of Canada? Well, we're not saying that you should for the good of Canada. Herman made the point for the good of the world. Well, why uh, should we have be, it for it the good of the world? Thing. Well, because the, the Canada, the, you, could, you could place 10 million people at fairly low densities in this very pleasant, uh, congenial environment. 10 million? Which is, which is more than... We've only got two and a half universe. million in the whole place at the Absolutely, moment. Absolutely, but look at the, the, your green space, your parkland, and the kind of development that you have. It's, we're talking about different kind of development. We're not, it's, it's not Vancouver as it is today. That brings me back, though, yeah. to the fact that you said that if we're attempting to save this land for agricultural purposes, we're idiots? No, I'm saying you, you're lying. Or, or you idiots. Or idiots, one of the two. Lying. Yeah, that is, people, will, they want to save the land, basically, because they, they don't want people coming in. That's perfectly legitimate. We want it for agriculture, so that we don't have to buy stuff from Mexico and the United States. Well, if you, if, you, if you want to be self-sufficient, then that, that's fine. You can buy it from other parts of Canada much cheaper. Than you, uh, in other words, 
if if I can take land at city uh, at at city prices and take that money and develop ten times as much acreage elsewhere in Canada, you see, uh, farmland is not is not normally uh, given to you by God. It's actually made in many cases, and you can create more land if you want. Uh, uh, and see, the idea that when a city encroaches on land, it's destroying uh, valuable property, is simply not true from the economic point of view. Let's so the land becomes valuable because it's close to the city. It's not the city that's encroaching on the land, All which right. is something that you have Just to Just let's look at the broad picture with each of you. Sure. Stagflation, inflation, a guaranteed annual incomes, massive rackets and unemployment insurance and all transfer payments. I'm quite convinced that the unemployment payments often go to people who do not need them. Can the so-called free enterprise system, so-called, yeah. with ferociously militant unions, like Cup W, for instance, and greedy rip-off corporate employers, of whom we're all convinced there are many exist, can the whole free enterprise bit collapse, last, or are we going to finish up with the egalitarian state with little niches for her new upper class? Uh, I rather suspect it'll last, and it's a tribute to its basic strength that it can take this kind of nonsense and still manage to get along. Not without a depression, though. Uh, I think you're going to have a depression basically to wipe out the inflation. In other words, there are two ways to control inflation. One is by uh, self-control and discipline on part of the federal government. Impossible. Uh, and the second is by depression. And which will come first, Marie, in Canada, Marie José Drouin? Self-control by the federal government, said Webster laughing, or by a depression? I think recession uh, will certainly come bef before and probably it, it's likely I would give even money uh, for a recession in the next couple of years. Even money but for a nuclear war, even money for a recession. But you only mean a turn down, you don't mean a depression. I don't mean a depression. If if people be, the term depression always connotes the 1929 uh, collapse, per collapse yeah. and certainly not of that depth, but a strong enough recession to uh, solve or to at least for the time being solve the inflation problem. What do we We're do not talking about a major How do we problem. look after the social needs of the unemployed when that recession comes in well, a country like Canada? The, the point that Major Zay made is a correct one. You're not likely to hit 1929 again by quite a bit. I, I think you may have something what I would call a depression, that it won't be 10 percent as bad as 29. In other words, you have so much surplus today, so much wealth in the system, uh, uh, that uh, basically the country can take care of almost what everybody. What do you mean wealth? Do you mean money in the system? Yes, there is a you lot. You mean cash? Cash. And only ca the, the system. I thought good. we could only get wealth by producing goods and exporting you them can. and selling them. You can. That's correct. But basically, a re relatively small part of the country today produces all the wealth that most of the people need. Now, they want more, I shouldn't say that. But uh, in other words, Canada is about $8,500 per capita, $9,000 per capita. It's, that's roughly, uh, uh, say, 10 times $1,000 per capita that, that is considered wealth in most of the world. You know, so you have an enormous surplus compared to the rest of the world. Is it cash available to be spent on people in times of depression? Well, the cash is, of, if, you're, if you're asking whether capital is available, uh, there's no capital shortage by any, you know, Without any, a change in the overall system? You, you're, you're simply not doing as well as you used to do, is the point. We'll you suffer a little, but not too much. That's exactly the point. I'm going to put you to callers now. I'm going to ask people to give their views to Herman Kahn and Marie-José Drouin on BC future. Ten million people in the Fraser Valley, even money in a nuclear war, even money in a recession. Uh, any minute now. Yeah. I'm enjoying this as nobody else is. No, no. Intelligent calls only, Linda. You may expect to get others in the new. Yeah, place. forget it, love. Well, I better tell people that. Are you there? <laughs> Hold on, love. Don't go away. I'll use you. I just got the bad news. Are you me. there? <laughs> Hold on, please. I'll use you. Don't go away. <laughs> Are you there? Hold. Thirty seconds. Hold on. Yeah. Where are they from, love?
I just got a terrible shock to my system. I announced the registration for the Bay Show for this BC as a Future 2 conference tomorrow morning. How much, Murray, it's not your conference, but you know the answer. How much is the registration for this big shot conference? $125. Say that again. $125. They'd be better to buy the book. We'll show the book. The book's $14.95. Have you got the book? Am I doing it right? Yes. That's only $14.95. That was a bit of a shock, wasn't it, eh? Well, it's, it's Canadian dollars. Okay. Oh, yes. <laughs> How low will the Canadian dollar go? Uh, that one I would just assume pass. You? Oh, I would say the dollar um, presently, well, if I, if I may backtrack, about two years ago we had predicted that the value of the Canadian dollar was about 85 cents. Yeah. We were practically being shot by, you know, from, from all sides. Now I think it's 85 is too low. 90 um, cents? 87, 90 cents. Makes it very difficult for these new upper class people that you and I each ate to go to Hawaii for Christmas time. One other question I was going to ask you, just very briefly, because sure. we've just got time for some phone calls. Will Canada, what is your prediction, although you do it like a horse race, you just give the odds, on separation? Quebec, not BC, Quebec. On separation, um, very low, the, uh, the, the chances of separation. On a new, f new constitution, obviously, and it may be you know, very close to what some people have called sovereignty association, though it hasn't been defined, but definitely a, a marked change. Okay. Does it matter to the world? Uh, yeah, come and can, if Canada splits in twain. If, my, if it splits in twain, it would matter a great deal, because everywhere in the world, there are separatist movements which have no real hope for getting any place. If Canada splits, you'll find a Wales movement, a Scottish movement, a Belgian movement, uh, the uh, Basque will get stronger, and everywhere in the world you can find people taking a second look. Bad or good? Uh, I think it's bad because it creates a lot of disorder that's not really necessary. But in some violence, places, killing. Yeah, violence, right. You don't predict violence for Canada, or do you, if it happens? Uh, depending on the circum that, that depending on the circumstances. Possible. Uh, it, it's possible, uh, but we've downplayed the violent scenarios. Going to try okay. some calls before you sure. go. Go ahead to Mrs. Cannon, yes, Mrs. Drew Ann. I wonder how long it's going to be before they decriminalize marijuana. And oh, go away and jump in the lake. Some idiot wants to know <laughs> when they're going to decriminalize marijuana. Go ahead, please. Yeah, is that me? That's you. Yeah. Okay, fine. Why don't we get to the real problem here, Jack? What is it? Well, the real problem I feel is that uh, the federal government, uh, Mr. Trudeau there, is causing our big problem, uh, inflating our dollar and letting it run wild. And then we come back to the point of our provincial government is doing the same thing, selling everything out to the United States for next to nothing. Somebody cared to tackle that? Well, for instance, we just recently transferred a vast mountain range in British Columbia, all the mountaintops from Princeton to, Ca to Kazoslokan to Weyerhaeuser, because they're the best employers. Is that good or bad as a national policy? I would make the assumption that you weren't taken because c today uh, Canadians know the value of their property. I would assume it's a, it was a deal which both sides gained. A good deal, eh? I don't know about, about the details. Well, we can't, we can't have you know, low productivity, high wages, and expect to maintain our comparative advantage and not uh, you know, have increased competition from the outside. So either we pull, roll up our sleeves and we get the job done and we do it productively and efficiently or else, yes, it's going to... Uh, and you would concede to me as a former executive assistant to Pierre Goyer, who is now copping out altogether, that the man who has given this slothful, you don't have to work, collect your unemployment insurance, uh, be a hippie in the early days, was Pierre Trudeau. Well, it's not only a Canadian, a Canadian problem. That it's a worldwide problem in, in he, most industrialized countries. He should countries. have pushed it, didn't he? Canada, yes, went, moved very quickly along the lines of the welfare state. Yeah, actually, it's we, more what we call uh, an Atlantic Protestant country problem. That is Scandinavia, Holland, England, US, Canada, Australia have this problem. Should we bring back, should we make a determined uh, effort, if we had some sympathy within the media, to bring back the work ethic, or is that nasty? I would, if I had my way, I would make a very determined campaign to do it, and I think it can be done. Bring back the work ethic, says Herman Kahn. Not as much as you had it 50 years ago, but a lot. A lot no, it's slave back. labor. Right. But a day's work for a day's pay. A day's work for a day's pay. Absolutely. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's about this currency deal. Now, they tell us that we're 87 cents or what it is to the American dollar. 85. The American dollar is at the lowest point in history. Is there any such a thing as a true basis of economics that anybody can sit on from around the world? A true base for economics, which oh, makes sense. 
uh, I, I happen to think that you could, you, could, uh, you could do a better job than we're doing, but basically not. Uh, currency is a question of faith in the future and trade balances. That's why gold is nearly at $250 an ounce today in London. That's exactly right. That's, that's, that's dangerous, isn't it? Uh, actually, it's uh, not much higher than it should be if you look at the devaluation. And that is, uh, if you go back to, say, 1900, gold is about where it should be. No, but it's dangerous because it reflects basic uncertainty in the yeah, system. it's a symptom. Uh, and then that's, that's the danger. Now, you did a study on the superpower. Didn't you? Oh, yeah. The Japanese super state. Yes. Is it beginning to slip a little? Uh, not as much as people think. Uh, a, uh, if they uh, just go along business as usual, they'll still pass the United States and Canada per capita income in the early 80s at 200 yen to the dollar, which is a reasonable change rate. And but they have the work ethic. They have the work ethic still. So do the right. Germans. Uh, less so than the Japanese. But more bit. than us. But more than us. Why is that? Well, it's also based on the structure of their society. It's a... It's a consensus prone society with a very strong sense of communal action which yeah. that in itself is a, is a well, tremendous drive to we still, we still the pioneer spirit some few of Canadian? oh some few but the sense of communal uh, endeavor is very weak in this country go ahead please where are you mr webster yes ma'am good morning morning i would like to ask your guests what they think now, I'm referring back to what you had mentioned about the Fraser Valley. Yes. And I'm speaking of the agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you guess think about, uh, in 1985, the number of Canadian farmers that will drop from 100,000 from the present, 300,000? Yeah, there'll be a vast drop in the number of Canadian yeah. farms and farmers. I beg your pardon? I'm just asking if they consider that an important matter. Yes, would they? Uh, I would, I like a country which has lots of small farms, just like Jefferson did. But under modern farming conditions, it's very uneconomic, and you've got to subsidize it. You must subsidize it. Yeah, and I would be willing to see some subsidy, but not a great deal of subsidy. And in Canada, you have to be careful. The number of farmers have, have decreased, but not the number, of the, the size and the, and the number of oh, farm, no uh, real farm land. It's, it's, not, it's because you've had an integration. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, Joe. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to make the point that it seems to me every time uh, we turn the television on these days, we're, we're getting the same thing. Um, I think this problem's been thrashed out and procrastinated upon enough. Um, I what? don't see that Herman and Marie are coming up with anything particularly different uh, or profound. It seems quite obvious to me that Canada is simply going through the same problems that uh, European countries have gone through and that eventually uh, they'll pull out of it simply because of their major resources. I can't see. It seems to me that uh, most of it is guesswork based on common sense. Well, uh, I think his statement is basically right. I wouldn't call it guesswork in the sense that he himself has noticed it and many other people noticed it. Uh, what we tried to do in this book was make it more precise, more comprehensive, uh, more depth. But he's basically correct. A uh, good deal of it is transparently obvious. In your book, Canada has a future. You don't give solutions. No, the book is not, it, it's not intended as a prescriptive uh, tool. Powell River, briefly. Go ahead, please. Oh, no, not that one. Well, that's the one. Which one is that? Go ahead, anyway. I'm on. Am I? Yes, you are. Powell River, yes. Uh, it, uh, I, I, I fail to understand just why these people are promoting, obviously, uh, uh, promoting the, uh, the uh, continuation of the uh, free enterprise system when uh, the whole of the rest of the world, other than the North American continent, are gradually and consistently turning towards socialization of the industry in order to make some common sense out of the production of the industry. Actually, it's terribly interesting that that is not happening. The exact opposite is going on. In all of Northwest Europe, you've now got a turning to the free enterprise system, or at least a real criticism of the social system. More important, there are 2 billion people living in middle-income countries, which are growing very rapidly by turning to the free enterprise system. That is, 
Uh, and everywhere in the world, people now notice that the free enterprise system works. Will, they, will the big communist nations eventually develop into a form of free enterprise? Uh, I don't know that, but they may well use market forces even more. It's what's going on in China right now. It's going on in Russia. Market forces? It's free enterprise? Uh, it's half a free enterprise. Mm -hmm. Marie-José Drouin, I'll see you at the conference, each of you. We, you and I are on a panel together yes. sometime tomorrow I'm afternoon. Looking forward to it. Man. But I'm not paying 125 bucks. I'm just going there as a guest panelist. Uh, Canada uh, has a future. That's the one thing we're all agreed on. Thank right. you. Thank you. Oh, don't forget. Next is <laughs> Brenda Rabkin on uh, Growing Up Dead. I'm not laughing at the book. I'm laughing because I had be, to be reminded to tell you about it. <laughs> not from the sublime to the ridiculous, but from the general kind of world and Canadian picture, to a picture which has haunted many people, the incredible phenomenon of teenage suicide. There always have been some teenage suicides, sometimes at play, sometimes by mistake. But in recent years, it has become a real social problem. I've interviewed over the years myself a number of people involved in this, but none had the expertise of Brenda Rabkin, who has written a book. and. Uh, it's really a very readable book, despite the title. It's called Growing Up Dead. I'll show you the book in a little while. And I saw the documentary that uh, Brenda did on television, on CBC, which was most impressive indeed. But uh, Brenda, I want to get you into the motives, first of all, to write the book and tell me if you think that your attitude and your documentaries and your book can actually help teenagers, or if you're merely kind of explaining for the consciences of parents what did happen. I'm actually hoping, and, and the whole reason for writing the book was that I felt that uh, the subject of teenage suicide was one that had to be talked about openly. When I first began researching the subject over three years ago, I encountered a tremendous reluctance from the professional community to talk about it. And one psychiatrist went so far as to say that he would categorically oppose any attempts that I made to uh, bring any public information to the subject because Why? he feared what he called contagion. The less people knew about this, the better. That uh, adolescents were impressionable, that, that they would get ideas from any documentaries or, or articles that I might write on the subject, and he would categorically oppose, those were his words, he would categorically oppose any attempts I made to deal with the subject openly. Well, how did you make the breakthrough with people? I you presume you're talking about a s psychiatrist of some kind. Yes. How did you make the breakthrough with the others? Only because I'm an extremely tenacious person and I got very stubborn about it. And the more refusals that I got, the more convinced I became that the subject really did need uh, an open treatment. Have you come to a decision or an opinion, more likely, that when the average teenager is growing up, they do at some time go through a certain form of trauma in which the eventual horrible thought might cross their mind? Certainly. Uh, one thing that convinced me that this book really needed doing, or that the, the documentary really needed doing, was that I recognized as I began to talk to young people that the elements for wanting to do away with oneself are indeed a very normal part of the life process. And I remembered very carefully and, and in great de detail what my own adolescence was like, and I'm not that far removed from it that no. I had difficulty remembering it. And certainly, uh, I did not um, attempt suicide, but I remember it as a time where I had no control over my own life. If things were bad, they were going to be bad forever. My parents didn't understand, and they would never understand me. Mm -hmm. School was meaningless, and it was going to stay that way. And I was fat and ugly today, and I was going to be that way forever. What I'm trying to say is that teenagers do not have the ability to put things in perspective. They're not adults, and yet they're not children. And if they have those feelings, combined with the feeling that no one really cares about them, it's a very dangerous situation. Is, 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 is there a category that you can say runs a particular danger at a particular age? Or is that even dicey to talk about? Well, we know... But what ages are affected by this phenomenon? 15 to 19 primarily. But we do know that the ages at which young people are attempting suicide are getting younger and younger all the time. And that's what I find terribly frightening. We used to say that uh, you'd find somebody who perhaps took an overdose of pills while being under heavy strain of studying, and you were pushing the two kids, the kids too far. Is that still a, a, a reason? 
Well, <laughs> well, I'll tell you what we'll do. Uh, I've got a little cue sheet here, which breaks into your documentary. So let's hear now from two girls who at least once took steps to end their lives. Well, let's see, up until the time I tried to commit suicide, I'd given several, uh, I guess what you call pleas for help. And uh, they weren't really noticed. And finally, I just had given up. I. Uh, what did you do to try and get attention? Oh, I went to different people. I tried to explain my problems and things, but they always, you know, put it off as teenagers, you know, always have problems. It's just an acne stage or whatever, and then send you away. But then finally, uh, I guess I wasn't, uh, I wasn't able to cope anymore, and, and I just figured that was it. What did you do? I took uh, about 50, 50 pills. Where'd you get them? I got them from a doctor who said I had bad nerves and gave me a lot of pills, gave me pills every, every week. And you saved them up and took oh, them? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I found the pills just put me to sleep every day, so I just put them in my drawer and finally took them all. Figured I might as well go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, I felt um, like I was worthless, um, that as a human being I, I had no worth. I felt like I was unloved, that no one in the whole world loved me. I felt like I was there was something wrong with me, that everyone else in the world had some secret that, that I didn't know because I was so, so unhappy and, and so depressed and, and so desperate. What kind of treatment did you get when you were brought to the hospital? I, I was treated like, um, as a matter of fact, one of the nurses said to me, how could you do such a silly thing? I, I was treated like, um, like just a body that, that was brought in and was made to throw up and, and was sent on her way. Um, I was made to feel ashamed and guilty about what I had done. Are you telling me then that your whole hospital experience never once took into account your emotional state, your psyche? Not once, no. They, they uh, had no compassion for me as, as a human being. They showed me no caring at a time when I needed caring the most and support when I really needed someone who would just sit down and talk to me and say like, hey, what's, what's, what's going on with you? I was treated like I was hysterical uh, girl flipping out because of a fight with her boyfriend. What was wrong there? Who was, was anybody other than herself to blame for this happily unsuccessful attempt? Uh, I, know, I know what you're getting at. You're trying to ask me if uh, the doctors were to blame for her attitudes. I think that there are two culprits in this situation, and one are the unknown contributing factors that made this girl feel so depressed that the only way that she could cope with her problems was by taking a, uh, what could have been a lethal overdose of pills. And the other issue that we're talking about here is the attitude of the medical personnel to her when she was brought into the emergency room of the hospital. So those are two distinct issues, and I, I think that both of them should well, be talked about. Well, can one expect compassion from strangers in a hospital emergency room? No. Generally, in Canada and the United States, the answer is unfortunately no. And there are several reasons for this. The big one being that the orientation of medical school people in their training is to save lives. And so when someone is brought into the emergency room, having just attempted to take his own life, that very act flies in the face of what the medical person has been taught to do. Well, what about sheer common humanity? Of course, the point is you're only dealing with bodies with blood in them and, and a heart beating, right? There isn't time, Jack, for this sheer no. common humanity. In the emergency room, what is critical is time. There may be a group of people who have just been brought in from a traffic accident. Mm. They are very close to death. And here comes someone who has just taken an overdose Some of pills. Some silly kid with an overdose of pills. Exactly. But then we go back to the silly doctor who gave her the pills in the first place. Unfortunately, doctors, and, and I think that uh, a large part of the problem lies with our expectations of doctors. We expect too much from them. Doctors are people just like everyone else. And we are, unfortunately, very reluctant to become involved with a troubled person. Go away. I've got my own problems. You've got problems. Keep them to yourself. I don't want to know about them. I'm going to take phone calls to you, too, this morning. Brenda Rabkin of Growing Up Dead.
The subtitle of your book is A Hard Look at Why Adolescents Commit Suicide. Did you finish up totally depressed with the whole business? You know, Jack, a lot of people ask me that question. Uh, they say, how could you write a book on suicide? Weren't you depressed? And you know that I spent two years researching this. And strangely enough, I'm, I'm not depressed because there was something about the, the nobility of the human spirit that came through in so many of these kids that I talked to. Mind that, you, the only ones you could talk to were those who were not successful in their attempts to be rather obvious. Yes, although now. there is one chapter in the book called The Boy Next Door, which is about Peter Walker, and he was successful in real killing names? himself. Real names? No, no real no names, real but name. he left uh, journals and poetry, and his parents contacted me because they knew I was writing this book. There had been a fair bit of publicity in the paper after I won the Actor Award and they said, we know you're writing a book on suicide and we'd like to be of help in any way we can. Before we get to the parents, because they're the ones who face the problem each and every day if they happen to have that set of circumstances around, let's get back to that doctor that gave Kathy 50 pills. How old was Kathy when she got the 50 pills? 15. Did her mother know she had the 50 pills? She knew. Her mother was taking pills as well. You have to remember Family that... Family tradition. Yes. In many cases where kids take an overdose of pills, they get the pills either from their family doctors or from their parents because they have learned a technique of problem solving and that is when you're in trouble you take pills or when you're in trouble you drink booze. Remember kids learn by example. In other words mama says look you're not feeling so well today you're excited about your examination you're around with your boyfriend here take two of my Valium take one this morning and take one this afternoon while you're in school. Or it may not even be the mother directly promoting the drugs it may just be that the teenager sees the mother taking them on a regular basis and says well when mum is down she takes them I'm down I'll take them. Have you come to a, a, a decision about the, the, the standard of treatment that these youngsters get from the medical profession? Their lives are saved their psyches are not and there is a movement afoot in Canada now, and, and it's not a new one. It's been around for several years, and right now it's being seriously hampered by the shortage of funds. The Toronto East General Hospital has it, for example, where there is a 24-hour emergency crisis counseling centre. Well, when someone is brought in, not just a teenager, anyone who is brought in after having attempted suicide, first they take care of the physical needs of that person, and then there is a counsellor there right at that moment who attempts in a very elemental kind of fashion to deal with the problem. You mean to give them at least the compassion? Just uh, something like, I care about you, you matter to me, I want you to live. Just a stretching out of the hand and saying, I care, you are a valuable human being. And for many people, it may be the first time in a long time that they're hearing those words. How, how does the alert parent, if they're not boozed or pilled themselves, and I'm just being cynical here, I don't really mean that, how does the alert parent spot a potential suicide in their own family? I'm glad you said alert parent, because parents must be alert to spot the signs. Well, it's like drug use. You've got to be alert to spot drug use in your family. But suicide is even worse, unless it's related to the drugs, I suppose. But how do you do it? The terrible tragedy about suicide is that the signs are always there in hindsight. And the clinical literature is filled with a description of the symptoms that one should be on the lookout for when one is trying to perceive a potentially suicidal adolescent. And those symptoms are uh, a change in eating habits, a change in sleeping habits, a fall in grades, a sudden fall in grades. Uh, suddenly that young person may withdraw and may not want to have anything to do. Depression, giving away of prized possessions, or an actual articulation of the feeling, oh, I'd be better off dead and you'd be better off without me. Pregnancy in a strict family? That. Anything, but you see, any of these symptoms, to me, uh, are just normal adolescent manifestations. And how does a parent know when these are just normal adolescent acting out and when they are actually indicators of suicide? Before we go to the phones, I want to show this other piece about treatment uh, the teenagers they receive, which sometimes is just as scary as anything else. Now, we talked to Kathy earlier, and she describes one such ordeal on your documentary called The Wet Pack Treatment. We, we were all given a, a certain psychologist or psychiatrist that we never did see. We were prescribed pills. I was on 15 pills a day and sleeping pills at night. And when my first doctor wasn't responding, he gave me to another doctor who gave me shock treatments. Uh, I remember one instance when I was agitated, they gave a treatment called a, a, a wet pack, where they wrap you up in wet sheets and put ice under you and ice under your head and hot water bottle and restrain you. 
and leave you there, you know, until you're no longer uh, agitated, until you've calmed down. You're going to calm down pretty fast like that, but it's about three hours. Did she say shock treatment too? Yes. Are they still giving shock treatment? Yes, although it's, it's, it's less favored than it used to be, but it's still being done. And the wet pack treatment, what was that? Well, when she'd get very agitated, they would wrap her up in wet towels uh, with ice, and as she said, she'd calm down pretty quickly after that. Is that a variation of the old hydrotherapy treatment they used to give to violent people? Putting them in a bath of some kind or another? Mm -hmm. In Kathy's case, and, and I don't think that her case is, is very typical, but as she uh, later said, they never made any attempt to deal with her problems. If she acted out and became uh, a little hysterical, and indeed you and I probably would under, under those circumstances as well, they would just treat the symptoms and never get down to the root of the problem. And Kathy came very close to spending the rest of her life in a provincial mental hospital. She was very short of just being signed away for life to one of those when a young intern from California came to do his training and he noticed her largely I think because she's so attractive and he made it his mission in life to save her and he did it by taking her off all drugs except the one that she had become addicted to and just talking to her and dealing with her problems and she said that this was the first time in three years that anyone had attempted to deal with the problems without giving her any chemical or drug treatment. In other words, you could almost say it's kind of gestalt therapy in a way and that what happened in the past didn't really matter, but it happened now was that somebody had to contact her and make her realize that life was worth living. Isn't it frightening to you, may I be interviewer sure. for, for a moment, isn't it frightening to you to, to watch Kathy and to mm -hmm. see how wholesome and intelligent and compassionate she appears and to know that she came very close to having been signed away for life? Yeah, but lots of people have. Mm -hmm. You know, once you get in a certain stage, and if she hadn't been such a pretty, pretty little thing, that young doctor might not have noticed her, and she might just have gone from nervous breakdown to nervous breakdown to God knows what not. Hmm? Phones next with Brenda Rabkin. <laughs> Uh, the news, uh, maybe I should want back behind and uh, boss, we're doing it. <laughs> Q, please. Stand by. Hello. Linda, where do I go on the phones? Linda. Hello. Where? Which one? Bottom one. Are you, Hello. Are you there in Ladysmith? 15, that's what I'm wondering. Hello. You know, p pay some attention. Go ahead from Ladys, uh, go ahead from Ladysmith. Where are you? Uh, where, 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 where do you mean, where am I? Well, speak up. I'm sorry. I just got a new pair of China, China clippers in. Uh, what I would like to say, though, first of all, that uh, um, uh, with Brenda, that uh, I haven't read a book, which I would be very interested in reading, but I went through exactly what she has been talking about. Well, tell us about it. How old were you at the time? At the time? I would say 17. And what were your particularly distressing circumstances that caused you to feel like this? Um, if you want to tell us. Yes, I, I, I don't mind. Homosexuality. That's a problem. Brenda, can you add anything to that? Please. Did you ever feel that you had someone to turn to to talk about your problem? Or did no, you feel that you were just so bizarre and so different that the only solution was death? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Did you ever feel that you had nobody to talk to and that you're only, you were so bizarre and so different that your only solution was the kind of ultimate way out? Uh, I didn't know about that at the time. And how did you get over this crisis? Uh, myself. You fought it through? I think I pulled my through, I myself through. The reason was I'm, uh, I'm not a junior anymore. I'm approaching uh, 40 next year. Mm -hmm. But uh, my father, of course, was during the war, and uh, I can... Well, I think we've got to congratulate you for getting through, and he's on. Many a person wouldn't have. Now, let me ask Brenda this question. A uh, question of sexual troubles nowadays, say, homosexuality or whatever, 
that won't cause the same problem as it did no, 20 years ago. Will I, I don't think that's true. Even though there may be more public acceptance of a homosexual, and even though there is a, certainly a, a much greater amount of organization on the part of the gay community, there is still that terrible feeling, I am different, I am weird, I'm not like everyone else. And you have to remember, Jack, that for a teenager, that's a terribly devastating feeling because a teenager has to feel that he is like everyone else, that he is accepted. It's the peer group pressure. And to be different and to be different for life but, is very hard to deal with when you're 15 or 16 years old. I may old. be totally wrong on this, but there isn't the same pressure within the peer group in school anymore. There isn't the same competitive demand as in my day, for instance, is there? Well, there may not be the same competitiveness with regards to achieving grades, but there is the same competitiveness just to be like everyone else. It can be simple things like money or clothes or lack of styles or, of course, the ordinary ones like maybe an emotional disturbance, which is there anyway. Well, you know, that's uh, the chicken and the egg business. Mm -hmm. Never know the answer to that one. Go ahead, please. Yes, Jack. Yes, speak up. Yes, I, I have the same problem. I'm 50 years old, homosexuality, suicidal three times, and uh, I'm just wondering if this lady can help somehow. No, how old are you now? I'm 50. Well, now, at the age of 50, there are enough facilities for you, and you're mature enough that if you can't find a place that can help you, you phone me later and I'll find your place. Go ahead, please. Oh, We're trying to deal with the problem of teenage suicides. Yes. Go ahead, please. Yes, hello. I feel this book is going to be very valuable, especially in schools. Uh, but I don't know about parents. Uh, I, had, uh, I was a teacher, and one of the students in my school was very close to suicide. She certainly was lucky to be pulled out of it. And her parents just dismissed it completely. They're just a silly teenager. Don't take her seriously. She's trying to attract attention. Of course, she was nearly dead. But the hospital was very good. Um, this was in a small town, or a reasonably small town. The hospital, the nurses were really, took her seriously. And uh, phoned the school, and about half the staff <laughs> said, oh, she's just trying to attract attention. But that's what she's trying to do, that's is exactly it not, Brenda? That's exactly right. Yes, I know. This is a silly part. I mean, just that's trying to right. attract attention can be showing off, or it can be a desperate plea for help. This is something that, that the public must be made aware of. When I say the public, I mean particularly those people who work in the front lines with teenagers. Yes. Teachers, in particular, parents goes without saying, yes. doctors, nurses, guidance people. It's absolutely critical, and if I'm going to get up on my soapbox at any one time during this program, it's going to be now. Do it. Because when uh, an adolescent does what we consider um, manipulative behavior, hysterical behavior, just trying to get attention, we have to give that young person attention because he is desperately trying to get it. He is going to attempt suicide when all other means of legitimately drawing attention to himself have failed. Okay. And we do know that 70% of adolescents who attempt suicide do it in the home when the parents are there. That's 70%. Now, surely, that tells us something. You mean downstairs in the basement? That's right. Yeah. Now, you, I'm an expert in a little way about jails. And when prisoners want to attract attention in jails, they cut their wrists. Never quite deep enough, sometimes deep enough to kill, but sometimes they'll slash themselves I know of one case, 365 times he slashed himself, one day for each day of the year. How, what does the form of attention getting, uh, what is it? How do they do it? In, in, mean, um, drunk, in the book, in, in Growing Up Dead, there is one girl uh, who tells her story, Lenore, and you, uh, I would like to remind you that these are all first person stories in, in the book. I am a journalist. These are not my stories. Not your stories. They are a result of 47 interviews that I did with uh, suicidal survivors. adolescents. Survivors. One who, one who wasn't. And there's one girl, Lenore, tried desperately to draw attention to herself. And first she wrote poetry in which she articulated her death wish and she submitted this poetry to her teacher. She got it back with a grade and with a comment saying this is very self-indulgent, selfish poetry. Mm -hmm. Then... The teacher didn't spot it. Nothing. 
Well, I think my own interpretation is that the teacher was uncomfortable with that kind of emotion and couldn't deal with it, and so he just threw back the buck and said, you take it. Mind you, you can't blame a teacher for not being competent to spot a potential suicide, Not can when you? there are 40 children in the class. No, it's, it's hard. agreed. Now, the second thing that this girl did is that she, in fact, fashioned a death mask for herself. She painted her face with white powder, and she went around this way for two weeks, hoping that someone would notice and say, Lenore, what's wrong with you? No one you noticed. mean in school? In school. Now, I admit that these are rather bizarre circumstances, but they serve to illustrate the extremes to which this girl went to draw attention to herself. When all else failed, she attempted suicide because, as she said, you can't ignore a dead body. Tragic. Thanks, uh, Brenda. More calls. Now, this is oh, don't go away. Hold on. If you're not finished yet, just hold on. I'll be back in a second. <laughs> I didn't cut that woman off. Carry on, woman. Oh, yes, thank you. I just feel that if, uh, I'd like to see this book in the education department of universities and in schools, because I feel the school is a place, and at the same time, the school is a place where they dismiss the people who try to attract attention. Yeah, but no, I won't let you away with that. The primary responsibility has got to be the parent, if Absolutely. any. Absolutely. Right? Parents, yes, but if, this if is the school the spots it, that's a bonus. The parents with no interest in the children or no communication. I refuse to believe that there are parents with absolutely no interest Problem. in their children. They may be stupid parents, but they've, they've got some interest, surely to God. Well, Did you find I, I was operating on that assumption when I began researching this book, and I was shocked at some of the things that I found out. Tell there me. were parents who were notified in the emergency room that their, their teenage son and daughter had just attempted suicide. Would they please come and get their son or daughter and bring him or her home? And they said, if that's the way my son or daughter is going to behave, you keep him. I don't want him. That's now, of course, we can read into that and say that that's a reaction to their own inadequacies and that they are very ashamed by the act that their child has just committed. But nonetheless, they are abandoning their child in the hour of his greatest need. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yes, yes. Yeah, I'd like to um, just say I was 16 when I took an overdose of pills here in Vancouver. Uh-huh. And I was taken to the Vancouver General Hospital. And after being made to vomit and everything else, um, a very young, very tired intern who'd been working four shifts came in and sat down and told me all his problems and didn't listen to me. And um, I feel very much close to the girl Kathy in the interview. She was made, I was made to feel very guilty for what I'd been putting my parents through that last couple of hours. You mean the intern made you feel guilty? Yes, he sat there and said he talked to some people and all he could ever say to them was, you did the right thing, you should commit suicide, you have so many terrible problems, but I was just 16. Just speak up just a little bit more, because I want to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. would, would you tell Brenda, who's had all the stories before, but I haven't, <clears throat> would you tell Brenda what made you take the overdose of pills and where you got the pills? Um, I guess I hadn't thought it through all that carefully. I suppose now if I did an analyst, I'd have found out I couldn't have died from them, but I took a whole bottle of 200 ASA tablets. I suppose I could have died if I hadn't been found. Then I just knocked on the door of my girlfriend that lived next door and handed her the empty bottle. I definitely did not want to die. I can see Why, though? Why did you do it? I was 16 years old, and I had been kicked out of the house for the last six months. I had been... Because of your own behavior? Pardon me? Because of your own behavior? Oh, I drove my parents to it, for sure. I mean, I could see that... They had no recourse if, you know, they wanted to live a reasonable life. I was causing a lot of turmoil in the house. Um, anyway, I, but I had been made to feel very guilty for not living at home through the rest of all of our relatives and everything else. And I had chosen the route of quitting school and working and trying to have my own apartment. And if you had to do it again, would you go your parents' way or still go your own way? I'm afraid I'm 25 now, and I still feel, as I look back, there are things I would have done differently on my own and things I wouldn't have got sucked into You'd on my own. You would have done better than that. Okay, Brenda, your observations. 
This caller brings to mind a point that I feel is, is very much worth making, and that is that most adolescents, I'm not talking about adults now, I'm talking about adolescents, most adolescents who attempt suicide don't really want to die. This caller just told us that she swallowed a whole bottle of pills and then went and showed her friend that she had taken the whole bottle, obviously saying, look what I've just done, please save me. What teenagers want is an escape from the intense pressures of the moment. They want sleep, they want peace, they want a break in the terrible agony. But death as a finality, no. In fact, uh, Peter Walker, who is the, the young uh, person who actually did succeed in killing himself, left very detailed and meticulous instructions for how he wanted his funeral orchestrated. It was almost as if he would survive and be a spectator at his own funeral. Even he, who successfully took his own life, did not perceive the finality of death. Why this is so, I think, is, is a subject for separate discussion. But certainly, uh, most teenagers who attempt suicide do not want to die. It's not a case for a school course, though, is it? Can I make one more observation? Yes, you may. Um, I'd just like to say, because I didn't get the counseling I needed, and I was still very, very confused when I was driven back home from the hospital that same night about two hours later, um, and no one had really seemed to be listening. I had been fighting for a long time. That was when I was 16, I'm 25 now. That was in the middle of our Fourth Avenue era and all of this off drug culture really surfacing. And it was right at that point, I think it was the very next day, I guess I tried to do it using a different drug and I got involved with um, LSD and masculine and all of the other soft drugs. And as I got older and tried to get out of that business, I replaced my need for escapism, I suppose, with the soft drugs, with alcohol. And it's just been the last two years that I haven't been drinking. You're clean now, are you? I've, I, d I don't know if my alcohol problem was so severe that I... It wasn't alcoholism, it's just I knew that I was... Ma'am, thanks for sharing your experience. Go ahead, please. Um, yes, I'm a 21-year-old now. And uh, I was... Hello? Yes, carry on. And uh, I attempted it three times. The first two times it was because I was just like tired and, like you said, wanting attention. But the third time I, um, I reached a point where I was just tired of living, just really tired. And I took um, a handful of volumes and a handful of libriums and then these other ones. And I put on three albums at a friend's place and was just really into dying. Uh, finally, an ambulance come to get me. I think a friend called, and I, didn't, I refused to go with them, and then some police came and arrested me. And they put me in the hospital. They arrested you for illegal possession of drugs? Uh, well, they didn't charge me at all. They just took me to the hospital to pump my stomach. And um, anyways, I ended Had up... Had you been heavy into the drugs before this final concerto that you were going to go out with? Um, somewhat, yeah, but it wasn't the drugs. It was just my personal problems. I was just... Um, I had a really hard time accepting myself as a person and uh, just getting along with my family and everything, being thrown from one to the other. And Broken home? Pardon, yes. Broken home? Yes. And um, anyways, I went in the hospital for like six weeks and I was just really, I don't know, they just didn't do anything to help at all. I seemed to be telling the doctors um, things that... Have you got it? Are you okay now? Now I, um, I, I left Toronto about three years ago and I traveled the country and uh, now I'm a bartender and just doing really well. Good for you. Have you one last message for parents? Tell your kids that you love them, tell them that you care, make them feel that they are valuable human beings. If we as parents don't tell our kids that, where are they going to hear it? They need to know that. You mean every time you have a row, don't forget to finish up with the fact that you love them. I think that's essential. You have to make yeah. the distinction between the aggravation of the moment, but keep in perspective the fact that your child is a valuable person, and even though you may be just roaring mad at him, you still care for him. How many case histories in this, 47? I interviewed a total of 47 to do the research for the book, but there are 10 young people who tell their own stories there. Listen, you've kept your sense of proportion, and we may have done some good this morning. You never know so. in this business. My thanks to Brenda Rabkin, a book growing up dead. Yeah. I morning Mike. Morning Mike. <laughs> Mike. 
The first part of the program was really quite impressive in its own way with Herman Kahn. He is the big guy, guy from the, the think tank on the Hudson. Canada has a future. It's a remarkably good book, but it doesn't give you any answers. It merely depresses you. <laughs> if you want the work motivated Canada that I would like to see ahead, Linda, tomorrow. Dave Barrett, tomorrow. Dave Barrett. The Dave Barrett. The leader of the opposition. Right. Tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. precisely.